so here we had came to a turning point because um, the memos and the pride videos were shared on Facebook and a fellow parent in our school district named Greg Marchant happened to see those and he got involved and we got in contact and that started a new turning point. So Greg and I began to review the books in the in the book bundle program. Here's a, just a couple of books that we found problematic, but there are a lot, but we're just going to go through two of them. So Anti-Racist Baby was on the list for kindergarten. I had a child in the kindergarten classroom, so this was a thing for me. It says babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Point at policies as the problem, not people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. And they're telling the baby, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Confess when being racist. Um, so this book was concerning to me because I've since learned that um, being racist or anti-racist, there's no neutrality, pretty much refers to um, critical race theory, that you can't simply be not racist. You either are a racist and you don't like people of color, or you're anti-racist. And in order to be an anti-racist, you need to own that you have power and privilege as a white person. And I don't agree with either of those ideas. I don't believe that it's right to persecute people of color or anyone. Right. And I don't agree that because I'm white, I have power or privilege necessarily. So I can say, no, I'm neither racist nor anti-racist. I am simply not racist. But this book is saying there's no neutrality. So it's teaching our children this idea and they have no choice to believe anything different because, hey, there's no neutrality. And I don't agree with that being well, taught. And this theme of anti-racism goes through several books on the same theme. Mm -hmm. We'll see this coming out. Right. And then confess when being racist. I just don't think that's something that we need to be teaching our little children, that they are inherently racist and they need to confess it. And then we had this book is anti-racist, which was for fourth grade or fifth grade, I think. Yeah, I thought it was for fifth grade. Okay. Um, so we have Black Lives Matter and Resistance, and they have the Black Lives Matter fist. And then here we have saying, um, she's saying that you should interrupt adults if they're saying, well, I don't see color. They call that a microaggression, and that's not okay. Um, they said in the book, it says, being racist against white people is not a thing. Reverse racism is not real. And then here again, we have a quote from Angela Davis, who says, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. So again, we have this idea that you're either racist or, or anti-racist. You cannot be non-racist. That's not enough. And then on the page on the right, she says, um, white people only listen to white people. So it's perpetuating stereotypes against white people. But, um, well, it's just perpetuating stereotypes. And then here, this was um, alarming to me that they're telling children to, if they see black people being arrested or pulled over by the police, that students should get out and and record with their phones or stand witness. And um, we should that students should intervene in a situation like that and call the police out for arresting black people. I think this is um, an important comment. This is what we're seeing, the intersectionality. We have um, been told many times that critical race theory isn't taught in our classes, but this is a quote from Kimberly Crenshaw, who is one of the um, founders. founders of critical race theory, and they're quoting her um, about intersectionality, which we already explained, in, or April already explained in the other. Um, right. Kimberly Crenshaw helped found inter the idea of intersectionality. So yeah, they're talking about her. And then they also say, if your parents or grown up say, make it great again, make America great again, call them out on their racism. So basically re referring to Trump supporters and saying, those are racist and you need to call that out. And if you're white, you need to step aside. Oh, right. And if you're white, step aside. And so here we're going to talk, is critical race theory in our schools? We have people debate, is critical race theory in our schools? No, it's just a law school subject. It's not being taught. If you don't understand what critical race theory is, then you're not going to recognize where it is in the schools. Here we've Googled, who founded critical race theory? Kimberly Crenshaw comes up as one of the founders. Um, intersectionality. The concept of intersectionality, one of CRT's main concepts, was introduced by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. Here again, we have Kimberly Crenshaw right there, as we talked about before. And then here, this was a training for our teachers. Kimberly Crenshaw, again, quoted right here. Um, we have Ibram Kendi. He says, if discrimination is creating equity, then it is anti-racist. So he's advocating for discrimination. As long as it creates equity, it's okay. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. And just like we are talking about with the uh, drama triangle, going around and around that triangle, there's no solution. We just need to keep discriminating. And it's not a solution. It's harmful. And then as we talked about with being racist or anti-racist, this is what's being taught to five-year-olds in our school district. This is critical race theory in our schools. Um, being racist against white people is not a thing. So it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. Again, that same idea. There's no such thing as being simply non-racist. You need to be anti-racist. And that is embracing critical race theory. Here is the lesson plan for this book is anti-racist for fifth graders. So asking students what are their social identities, what is race, what is racism, um, creating lists of their identities. So this is basically intersectionality. And then now write down your identity. And are there parts of you that hold power and privilege within your community? All of these words, all of these concepts 
are from critical race theory. And if you don't understand what critical race theory is, then you won't recognize it. But once you understand what it is, it's easy to recognize. Their language shows it. Right. And then the concept of race is not actually based on science. It is a creation of society. So that's a basic tenet of critical race theory, that race is a social construct. So when you see these ideas, you'll know this is CRT in the classroom. Um, here we have Black Lives Matter. That's the activist organization of critical race theory. And it's saying it's not political. This is human rights. Okay, so at this point, Greg and I started emailing with Superintendent Covington. I had emailed her before, and several other parents had emailed her, and we were not getting responses from her. And Greg started to get involved, and I was like, why is she replying to Greg's emails but not mine? And I, we came to the conclusion that it might have been because he was CCing about 40 people on the list. He was CCing a lot of principals and community council members and just a lot of people. And because there were so many people on the email Miss Covington was, seemed to... It was time for her to respond. She would reply to those emails. So here's Greg's first email. Like we said, we're not going to read through everything because there's just not enough time. But if you want to pause, you can read through these. Greg's second email, she, re she replied. He's replying back to her. He's explaining what's going on. Her reply on February 5th. And here's where she said this was an isolated incident in one classroom. Greg's reply on February 8th. Do we and want then, to summarize anything from that? From these emails? Just that they, you can look at them if you want. Yeah, basically you can look through them. He's just discussing what he learned through the Pride Conference and the memos, etc. And then he said, I'll let April reply about the Call Me Max incident since that happened in her child's classroom. So this is what I wrote and basically just said the questions that I've had and summarized with 10 questions. And um, Ms. Covington replied on February 9th with answers to those questions. But um, a lot of those answers just didn't add up. It didn't give you... It didn't satisfy my, my questions or Greg's questions. So at this point, we composed this, what we call the 13-point email. And on February 6th, we sent that out to many parents. And we wanted to inform them of what was happening. And we wanted them to get involved because we felt like what we were doing wasn't getting us all the answers that we needed. And we needed more parents to stand up. Yeah, definitely not getting um, answers where your questions were answered to the uh, extent that you're like, okay, I understand this program. I understand how to navigate with my students, teachers, all those things where you're like, why do I still feel so like I'm not getting so confused? Yeah. And I'm getting confused. I'm getting different answers for these questions. So, right. So this, it just didn't feel resolved. And so, yeah, at this point we sent we composed this 13 point email, which we'll go through. We're not going to read it again. You can read it, but we basically just explained what had happened in Murray school district and what we were concerned about and that we wanted parents to speak up and ask questions to the school board and to the superintendent and to their principals. And we attached the relevant, the relevant documents, the memos, the book bundles list, um, the equity memo, all that. And Laurel got this on February 6th, February 7th, she got it. And I, I was really surprised because um, April and Greg had already gone to all the people that I would have recommended them go to in the school district. I was just really surprised because um, like, why, why hadn't they answered the questions? And like, there was more to this equity um, stuff going on than what you know they were saying so I, I started getting concerned because I understood some of the equity ideas when it came to education that it, it would affect how our students would approach academics and that was concerning to me mm -hmm. um, and then later we're going to go into this later but we um, were able to submit a grammar request which is the freedom of information act for Utah and get access to some emails so later we found that after we finally sent this 13 point email Dr. Or, um, Ms. Covington started asking questions to Vanessa Job. So here's right after the Call Me Max incident occurred, and she's saying to Vanessa, thank you for pointing that out, Vanessa. I absolutely see your point. I think some parents are further along in this process than others, the equity process. I am thankful for your and Whitney's work on this and know that our students will be so much better because of it. So parents are pushing back and saying, hey, we have serious concerns about what's going on. And Ms. Covington, her basic response is just going along with it. Like, that's great. Parents will be so much, parents and their students will be so much better because of this work. And and at the same time, she's responding to me and Greg and saying, I'm giving us all these answers and we're not feeling like it's resolved. Then we, Greg and I, Compose and send this 13 point email. And that, it isn't until then but she asks, that she asks, Hi, Vanessa, could you please let me know how the book Julian is a Mermaid came into the classroom? I did not see this on the original book bundle list that was sent out. So she didn't ask that question until after parents had pushed back and gotten more parents involved. And you'd sent many emails already. Right. And we'd asked so many questions. And I don't, I am not sure why she didn't ask Vanessa long before that, but it took about a month for her to do that. And here Vanessa says it came from a fourth grade classroom and that the King's English Bookshop, she said she didn't know the owner, but she knew someone who works there and he helped with the book list. And that was Nathan Spofford. Here he is holding up Julian as a mermaid in the Pride Conference. And then here's an email the next day. Covington is saying, if I'm reading your message right, the reading of Julian as a mermaid is, was a teacher decision. Is that correct? I'm not necessarily concerned with the assignment if that, if that is the case. Um, so at this point, after the 13-point email, the Equity Council was paused February 8th. They, this was sent out through Parent Square, I think. They placed a hold on the Equity Council. And then here's a message from Darren Dean to the Equity Council saying that they're, they're on hold now. 
So after the Equity Council is paused, um, on February 11th, there's an article that's um, that comes out from the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, it's very one-sided, saying that parents are uh, pretty... Um, they don't understand, you know... This book was read, it was brought in by a student, and now parents are asking this whole equity program to be shut down. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's just saying all of this stuff. Parents are so um, uninformed that, you know, how could they ask this this of the school district? And could, yeah, why would they want to shut down the whole program when, when the student wasn't brought in the book? This and wasn't, wasn't even part of it. Yes, and we put the whole article in here if you want to read through it. We're not going to read it, but we'll click through it. Anyway, it goes uh, viral like we... Um, we said at the beginning, it went to all different news, um, and they did post the list. This is the first time I see the list of the, the equity books. Yeah, so they posted the equity book bundle list on the news article. On it the news article, even, but it wasn't on a website. Yeah, it hadn't even been posted for parents anywhere, but here they posted in the Salt Lake Tribune. So, so here are some of our other, I mean... So at this point, the article goes viral. It goes all over. Yeah, there's a lot of um, press, and, and as parents, we were trying to um, reach out to news stations saying, hey... Could we give you more information? Because this is not how everything's gone down. So there's also a, um, a letter to the editor that is written from all of Kyle Lukoff's or some of Kyle Lukoff's students. And this was February 28th, so like a couple weeks later. But one of the questions they asked was, we aren't sure why Call Me Max would cause the board to pause its equity book bundle program when it wasn't one of the books in the program. But the emails at the beginning all said it was part of the equity book bundles program. Right. When I saw this, I'm like, well, I'm not sure either. <laughs> yeah, why would they pause it if this wasn't part of the program? Yeah, it was part of the program. That's the whole reason that they paused it. And it makes no sense. That's why the students ask this. But that's the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. And so then part, as part of this issue, the Salt Lake Tribune had listed a, a link to a page that it said that there was a page on the district website, website explaining the equity program. And we're just going to go into that. Then Jennifer Covington receives an email on February 11th, the same day well, the evening of the article. And this parent says, after hearing about these issues in January, I searched the schools and district sites for a mention of the book bundles or equity council and found neither. Imagine my surprise in reading the article today and they mentioned there was a page for them. There are archival sites that show no page existed as well. So I was very bothered by this lie. So she's saying there's a link in the Tribune article saying here it's posted on the district website and she goes to find the link and there's nothing there. Right. So... From the grammar request, we could tell Ms. Covington made no reply to this parent's email, but the link on the Tribune article disappeared with no explanation or update to the article on that change. So here is the original article, February 11th. This is the link that they put in. They said the district has removed the page on its website explaining the program, with the blue part being the hyperlink. And when you clicked on that hyperlink, it took you to this. Error 404, no, page not found. The next day, after the parent had written that email, that link disappeared. So here they are together. This is the February 11th with the link. February 12th, link disappears. And here were screenshots from our phones. Because for me, I screenshotted everything when it happened. And so later we went back and looked and we're like, where, the, where did that um, link disappear to? <laughs> so that was interesting. Greg writes an email to uh, the superintendent Covington about how parents feel about this article coming through the Tribune, knowing that somehow someone in the school district told of all of this information to them because they had to get it from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're working with them trying to figure out what's going on. And someone has to get information to the Tribune. Right. And, and it wasn't from the parents. Yeah. And the, in the Tribune article, Doug Perry is quoted all over the place. So the district was clearly interviewed and gave comment on this Tribune article. So and, and Greg just comments saying parents are given no voice in that article. And it portrays and characterizes us parents. And it's as not, racist and homophobes. Yeah. Not just Greg, but all of us as racist and homo homophobes that we that we're just afraid of that. And we're just, you know, white people. And that's not true. We just want to know what's going on in the education of our kids. Right. He said, all we wanted was some transparency, some straight answers, a partnership, and to protect our children. Um, and then he talks about how there's no mention of all these things. Like, why for two weeks, parents were told that Call Me Max was part of the program. And about the memo, and where did Join as a Mermaid come from, and about the author section being read. All these things go unmentioned in the article. And the, he was clearly upset. I think all of us were upset. And Well, and to have it go so viral and be going... They didn't even ask any questions to parents about, like, what really happened and why we're concerned. It was just all that we don't care about people of transgender or, you know, gay people or, you know, we're just we're just so um, biased. Right. And um, well, well, it was very concerning that um, the parents felt like how else would the Tribune get this information? Right. Because it didn't come from the parent side. Right. So then we just from our grammar request, we show the district reactions to the Tribune article. This is an email from Doug Perry to Jen Covington on February 13th. And Doug Perry is, in, is the director of communications and um, public information, public information for the school district. So he's probably the one who's getting the information back and forth. Right. And so he sends this email to Jen Covington saying the narrative is spreading. It's you know going a little bit viral. And the narrative is the same, that our suspension is perceived as permanent. And 
he just is saying, should we lift the suspension so that we don't look bad? And he said, um, if the story dies off and we come out saying we have this great plan, it will put us right back where we are now in the public eye and remind everyone what happened. So um, then Jen Covington replies and she says she's concerned about how Call Me Max made the, ID, made the statement parents are wrong. And that's something that we can never say to our um, students. But mainly this is just saying, I don't think any of us want to sit on this too long. We don't want to look bad in the media. We don't want to look like we have a permanent suspension, so we better lift this and move forward. And, you know, you have this email from Greg saying how upset parents feel, but that's not really what they're discussing. They're discussing their appearance and, and yeah. how the school district looks in, in the media. media. Mm -hmm. So here we add that to the timeline, February 11th, the Salt Lake Tribune article and the website discrepancy. At this point, parents started to get serious. We So we hired an attorney to help us understand the laws and, and what like what was really like school law versus like what we were, you know, are we just kind of mad as parents? And um we do submit some grandma requests, the first one. Right, so when we talked to an attorney, that was what they had suggested. You can do grandma requests to find out what's really going on. And so that's what gave us the idea to do that. Yeah, yeah. They said, well, you can you can get the Freedom of Information Act request that in Utah they're called grandma, um, which is government records, um, accounting management. Something. something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, so so um, Greg put in for all the equity council minutes um, and meeting, you know, outlines right. and then he also starts looking through all of the board meetings that are posted on the district's youtube page right and a lot of these board meetings were during the time of covid so parents weren't invited to attend during that time and you know we just hadn't paid as close of attention as we should have well and no one was allowed in the school so i don't know this was like the first year that i hadn't spent so much time in the schools it was very unusual for me um so it was interesting to um to see what uh, greg found in um looking at all of the um board meetings the board meetings so there was a training with the school district at the beginning of the school year. Um, well, in the summer. It was the, well, yeah, before before the school district starts, I mean, the school year starts, they always do training, professional development training for their teachers. And this was part of it. It's called Listening with Care. And they have um, a group of 12 panelists and um, they talk about COVID and how, how COVID is impacting our schools. And... Um, they asked teachers to give re heartfelt responses on this, and this, the responses from the teachers centered on how do we make a difference with the social unrest that's happening. And some of the people on the panel were Dr. Jackie Thompson, Dr. David Dominguez, Dominguez Michelle Loveday, um, Ms. Me Megan Zar Zarnetsky, and Dr. Clustina Mahon Reynolds. Um, and they, those two share the screen together, and we've since found out that they run this company called Process Forward, and they were the ones who planned this um, listening with care training. Um, and, and Greg found this in the the it's YouTube channel, the district YouTube channel with all the rest of the board meetings. So that's how he stumbled upon this. Um, and then we have this just a really short video from this listening with care so training. You, you could go on the district. Well, <laughs> you can't find this anyway. Yeah, they removed, <laughs> they've since removed this. But there are, you know, all the board meetings are stored on the district YouTube page or Jennifer Covington's YouTube page that um, you can go back and look at anything that if we if we edit things just to make them shorter, you can go find the longer versions. Mm -hmm. So this is just about a minute clip from um, what they're saying in this meeting. Arundhati Roy, and he says, whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty meal and brought the world to a halt like nothing anyone else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So basically, we have Klaustina Mahon Reynolds saying that COVID is a portal or a gateway for this social change. And we can leave the carcasses of our old beliefs behind and, and embrace the new mm -hmm. and walk in with very little luggage. Yep. <laughs> Um, so, like we said, this was done by Process Forward. And, and they train, I guess, school districts or anyone who wants to be trained on... This says up here, providing diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops for businesses and organizations. So, it's schools or any businesses or organizations. So, they do workshops and strategies for undoing racism, and they have all different um, workshops. This is um, Dr. Mahon Reynolds and then Megan Zarnetsky. And, and so these are just some of the lists of... Some of the trainings. Trainings that they do for uh, businesses and organizations they train talking about intersectionality and history of racism and whiteness and white supremacy, again, intersectionality, anti-racist strategy, anti-bias practices, and then the books that they're encouraging people to read, How to Be an Anti-Racist, The Right Fragility, Culture Wars, Between the World and Me, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together, Is Everyone Really Equal, New Jim Crow Law, I'm kind of reading those out of order, but that's okay. And then later in a meeting that we're going to go over, uh, we just have Robin Williams, she talks about their equity work in the district so far, and she here mentions listening with care. And she talks about the same, the people that we mentioned in Mahon Reynolds. 
And these are all the equity things that have happened. Um, yeah, because parents were starting to ask questions like, what's really going on? We don't know anything about this council. We don't know what this all means. And so they had a district um, meeting on all this stuff. And here's um, Robin talking about what the listening with care training was really about. When we asked Carol Anderson to share out all of the workshops, book studies that she's done, it was too big for our, our little um, flow chart here, but she gave some of those with the PD on tough kids, behavior interventions, again, multiple opportunities with SEL and social justice. And then I would like to pause for just a minute to talk about the work that has been happening since this summer. And again, I would, I would uh, remind everyone of the impact of COVID and the social unrest that has been happening in our country. And we are very proud of the work that our community and our teachers have committed to. We started on July 29th with 12 panelists in an unscripted conversation who had stories to share about their experiences in our community and teachers wrote responses to that. And if you remember as a board, those responses were shared with you. I don't know if you had opportunity to look at those, but 203 teachers attended and participated in that conversation and had heartfelt responses that centered on how do we make a difference with the social unrest that's happening. We continued that training uh, with listening with care, with teacher training with Michelle Loveday, Dr. Jackie Thompson and Dr. David Dominguez. We also had listening with care training that included some of you as school board members and all of our administrators with Dr. Mahan Reynolds and Ms. Arnetsky. Our equity council's work and direction is one that we also very much appreciate as they continue to ask the question about creating an inclusive community for all. And um, I also would highlight for us the equity council presentations to you as a school board with many of our members of the community, including Dr. Mahan Reynolds, Dr. Thompson, and Amanda Darrow. Okay, so that's just basically giving background on listening with care. And so we learned this just from watching old board meetings and then this February 25th board meeting. And this board meeting. Yeah, we'll show a little bit more from that too. Yeah, we're going to discuss that quite a bit. So, But that just shows that this happened in the summer. They had uh, professional development all about these equity issues in July. Mm -hmm. And then later, we're, this will be discussed later on, but this video has since been removed in approximately March. We're not sure exactly when, but all of a sudden it disappeared from the district's YouTube website um, when Claustina Mahon Reynolds was hired as our Hillcrest Junior High principal. So we're not sure why that happened, but that's what happened. Okay, so on around February, we learn about this listening with care training. Okay, so at this point, Laurel composed and sent out an email outlining her concerns to other parents in Murray District, and she just let them know about the public comment session and that parents could um, send in emails outlining their own concerns, having heard what was going on in our district now. And then on February 22nd, we received the Equity Council meeting minutes from our grandma request. Um, this is an email from Darren Dean. He says he's talking about these equity meeting minutes that we're going to receive, and he said he looked through them, and October 22nd, he will, you'll find that the book bundles are referenced, and on December 10th, you'll find sexuality and gender reference, and that these are some notes, places he noted in the equity minutes that might lend to confusion. So this is Friday, February 19th, so right before we get the meeting minutes, he's discussing with Doug Perry and Jennifer Covington. Like, there might be some confusion on what the equity council is saying that they're mm -hmm. doing. And this, and this is right before the February 25th board meeting, so they're like, oh, parents are going to find out about this. How shall we resolve this? Um, and then here we have Jennifer forwarding this to um, uh, Jaron Cooper, who's the president of the Murray School Board. And she said, our public will have these soon from Mr. Marchant's grandma request. And I have some definite concerns around some of the topics that were discussed and the way the meetings were structured. Um, and then we have Jaron Cooper to Jennifer Covington, and he's talking about some of the issues. And um, it's disappointing that an equity council right here at the bottom is that's being asked to educate district staff on how to dialogue in a safe and inclusive manner mentioned the board as a few white folk when they received pushback on some aspects. Just seems counter to what they're claiming to stand for as a council. And so here's the meeting minutes. We see when they held their meetings. So they had leadership meetings and they had general council meetings. So, yeah. um, so the council started in March 2020 and then they formed a leadership team in, in August 2020. And then this is just all the different meetings that they had. Um, and then these were just some of the, we just underlined some of the things that we thought were concerning. Just uh, problematic statements and things that are considered divisive or offensive. They want it to be a safe space. And if someone's not honoring that, how should that be addressed? And then Job's suggestion, Vanessa Job said that the district needs to have clear messaging. And the more clear it is, the clearer it is, the easier it will be to control that type of divisiveness. And we just find this um, a little bit alarming that safe space means we need to control people if they speak differently than what we agree with. <laughs> right. Okay, so here's another equity council leadership team agenda, just um, things we thought were um, things, things to bring out. Mm -hmm. um, so they were discussing the Black Lives Matter phrase as part of the November 23rd memo. And the school board was, and also Jennifer Covington, they were just saying they don't want to put that organization into a district memo. Then the equity council says, uh, it's just extremely disheartening when three board members who are white, they're all white, experience some discomfort. And they say, this is an example of institutional racism and the powers that keep it in place when there is con more concern for the comfort of a few white folk. And then as a side note, we wanted to mention that the equity council leadership team was also all white folk. Right. 
And then on December 10th, we f find reference to these um, GLSEN posters in Parkside and Horizon. And we also had a substitute teacher who was also a parent who reached out to us and said she also saw these GLSEN signs in the classrooms. And this is from the GLSEN website that talks about the Trump-Pence administration has attacked the marginalized and then it talks about registering to vote. So it's clearly political. You know? There is a political side to this, um, though they always say it's just a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another equity council leadership team agenda that we thought was interesting that we had parents subject to a book at Horizon. They want clear communication to parents from this district on the policies and professional development about equity. And they're saying there are two sides to this story, empowerment of those who are LGBTQ versus these parents' concerns and misconceptions. And so here they're talking about putting it on the website, making it um, making equity work visible to parents because parents have no idea. This isn't on the website. This Parents haven't been invited to be part of this council. And then they're discussing, should we invite, if we invite parents, what do we do if they challenge? What if they become hostile? How do we have flag for help if needed? So they're really that worried. seems really interesting. They're worried about adding parents who don't agree yeah. with their ideas. And then here, part of the equity meeting minutes was that they were requesting an equity director. So here's the email that was sent to Jen Covington from the council. And then this is just another copy of that that's easier to read, hopefully. So we just put that in. And then we found um, the equity council presented to the Murray School Board in September. And right. this was their presentation that they... They did with they Dr. Jackie Thompson, who was also on the Listening with Care video. And they're just talking about um, Black Lives Matter and why that needs to be in our schools. Slavery, the civil rights movement, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, then the cops... And then to create welcoming, affirming, and inclusive classrooms and schools, we need Black Lives Matter signs, apparently. That's what they're saying. Right. And all these are some their ideas that they want happening in our schools. Some more Black Lives Matter signs. And then um, they presented the Horizon Equity Book bo Boxes. And this, again, is in September of 2020. So they're presenting the Horizon books as we're starting this equity book program at Horizon. Right. And this is the Equity Council presenting. This isn't just... This is the Equity Council presenting these book bundles. And... Um, so she's explaining the professional development that they did in conjunction with the book bundles. And then she talks about the themes. Here's the list. She says it's from King's English Bookstore, which is Nathan, where Nathan Spofford works. Um, she talks about the justice team. And then she shows the book list to them. And these are some of the books and a playlist, apparently. And then they did restorative circles. And here's some one of the questions, I guess, that they talked about in restorative circles. And then they're showing some work from a fourth grade classroom. And she, this um, student is talking about Black Lives Matter. And here's a bunch of students speaking of Black Lives Matter standing up for justice. And then this is where we realize that, okay, here's how they're making the claim that they, they shared a list. Because here's where, like we talked about at the beginning on September 3rd, she post, Vanessa Joe posted about the equity book boxes. She didn't send a list, but some parents had replied to that post and they said, uh, I want to see the list. What's this? And so she replied to those people and said, oh, here's a list. And then here's another parent saying, hold up, what are these books? I want to make sure I'm comfortable with my child reading these. How can I get a list? So Vanessa Joe replies to her and here gets her a list. Um, but she did not post a list on the school website or the district website anywhere. And I, as a parent, had never seen a list for my class, my child's classroom, either of my child's classrooms, or just for the school in general. And then here's just some more of their presentation, which we'll click through. And then they um, wrote this M Murray City School District Commitment to Equity Statement. This was written by the MCSD Equity Council Leadership Team in June 2020. And then they provided them with a list of the okay. people on the Equity Council. And there was one parent. And then here's some of their um, resources. And some articles that they gave to the school board. And here were their suggestions to the school board. And they wanted to be, the Equity Council is happy to ensure policies are updated. They wanted to write policies for the school district and send out a revised memo and all this kind of, you know, equity director. And they wanted, they were saying we need um, continuous training for the staff, so professional development. And then here was an example of revised memo that they wanted to send out before they had gotten it. Um, they had to change it up a little bit, but this was one of their originals, original ideas. And then here we have Greg. This is a, a dad in the district who's worked a lot with us and helped us out. So we're just going to show what he said at this point. The Murray City School District Equity Council. It was created by almost exclusively teachers. And there was one parent on the Equity Council that has a gay son who she was handpicked. No other parents were asked to be on council and were not part of the council. Their mission essentially was dismantle systemic racism and to center the marginalized um, groups in the curriculum. And they met uh, once a month or more, um, basically in secret because no parents had been told about the Equity Council. They did have meeting minutes, which we obtained through a grammar request. And so we were able to find out a lot of what the Equity Council's mission was, what they were trying to achieve and how they intended to go about it. But what we didn't know was that the Equity Council had uh, obtained the authorization of the school district to essentially act on its behalf. 
The school district in August of 2020 wrote a memo that basically told teachers that they needed to keep politics out of the classroom, but the Equity Council was offended by that memo. And so they wrote a new memo that said that marginalized students would be centered in the curriculum, that they believe that Black Lives Matter, and that Black Lives Matter uh, signs and symbols and LGBTQ uh, pride flags would be permitted in the classrooms and in the schools and the hallways. Okay, so that was taken from another video, but we just want to have Greg speak and, and tell that part. Uh, so we put this on the timeline. On February 22nd, we, rece 22nd, we received the shocking, to us, shocking equity meeting minutes. <laughs> 